History happened everywhere. A random place, a random time, and a topic pulled from the hat. The challenge? Find the fascinating, uncover the unexpected, and share the stories. You're listening to... History happened everywhere. Hello and welcome to History Happened Everywhere. My name is Ryan Weir and I am here in the HHE studio with the lady to my tramp. It's Mr. Peter Goddard. Oh, if only I'd known I was the lady to your tramp, I'd have bought some spaghetti. Oh, but you've put the makeup on though, so that's good. This is, this is how I roll, Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> All times. You wouldn't catch me out of the house looking anything less. Fully elegant. <laughs> So, Peter, the Durza later last week, it gave us a bit of a stumbling block, didn't it? It was making a breakthrough in the Gambia during 1300 to 1400. Yes, the Gambia. It's a special little sliver of a country. Um, it has history, but we're looking for a very specific period, quite an early period as well, a hundred year window of happenings. Yeah, we've had trouble with Africa in the past with those early periods, not giving us very much. Yes, and I have to admit it was a struggle. So over the next hour, Ryan, you're going to find out if I eventually made a breakthrough and oh. continue to discover that history indeed happened everywhere. <laughs> Interesting. OK, well, should we get started? I think we should. All right, let's do it. So, the Gambia. Yeah. It's been a bit of a journey to get that name, interestingly. In 1965, they became independent, and that was when they were called the Gambia. They became a republic in 1970, becoming the Republic of the Gambia. In 2015, it became the Islamic Republic of the Gambia. And then in 2017, it changed back to a Republic of the Gambia. In fact, it is one of only two countries that use the word the in their names, the Bahamas and the Gambia. Do you think there's more? Because you've got things like the Republic of the Congo. The Bahamas. Ukraine. The, the world well, Ukraine famously don't want a the in their name. Generally, countries where there is a the are synonymous with regions or geographic entities. So the Gambia yeah. is the Gambia River as well as the Gambia country. So mostly having a the kind of indicates not a nation state, but a, a general region. Right. So it sort of reduces its importance. Exactly. Now, the interesting thing about the Gambia is they actually went the other way. When they declared their independence, they specifically requested to have a the in their name. And it's believed it's part Partly because that same year, Zambia was getting independence as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> and they wanted something to set them apart. Otherwise, there <laughs> maybe some confusion. So they embraced the the, whereas most other people uh, aren't so keen. Yeah. I think it makes it sound grander. It's the, the Gambia. Not, not a Gambia, right. is it? It's the Gambia. Like any old Gambia. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can respect it. I think it's, uh, it's nice. I think it gives it a certain oomph, doesn't it? Yes. Hey, Pete. Hey, Ryan. Or actually, um, it's not anymore. I've changed my name. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't want people confusing me with your cousin Brian. So, inspired by the Gambia, I've changed my name to The Ryan. The Ryan. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it makes me sound more authoritative. You know, more grander. And that's official, is it? It's on your passport and everything? Yeah, yeah. Look, here. Oh, okay. But uh, look here, look. You haven't put a space between The and Ryan. This says Therian. What? No. It's The Ryan, clearly. Parcel for Ferian. Oh. So, where are we? I think you probably know we're in Africa. But whereabouts in Africa? On the western coast. We're just on the border where the big yellow deserty bit becomes the greeny, not deserty anymore bit. So we've got the dusty Harmattan winds that we've talked about before, the horrible winds that come down full of dust from the Sahara yeah. in the dry season. And we've got the rain pounding down, soaking the ground in the wet season. So we've got a rainy and a dry season uh, in the area. Now, some of this might sound a little bit familiar because we have pretty much been here before because we hmm. did an episode on the country of Senegal. And the Gambia is entirely enclosed within the country of Senegal. But it's its own country. It is its own country, but it's uh, it's not quite an enclave. An enclave is a country that is entirely surrounded by a second country. Oh, okay. Um, but the Gambia is, basically what it does is it follows the strip of the river Gambia all the way up. So it's just either side of the river for the lower reaches of the river for a certain number of kilometres. And so 
they have a little bit of coastline, but other than that, everything else is Senegal around it. So that means a lot of the things that we've talked about before, I won't be covering again because you've heard about some of the tribes people, you've heard about some of the foods, you've certainly tasted the food. But the whole area is known as Senegambia. And when you look back to the kind of period we're talking about, the distinction between Gambia and Senegal would uh, just simply didn't exist. So the Senegambia is more what we'll be talking about as a whole. Okay. Um, but yes, it's not an enclave. It is a semi-enclave because it's got its own exit through the, the west coast into the ocean. Right. Okay. Oh, of course, the, the, the ocean prevents it from being fully enclosed. Exactly. The, the, right. You've got a sea, sea escape, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as I say, it's on the lower reaches of the Gambia River on both sides. So it's essentially river coastal as a country. At about 11,300 square kilometres or 150th of a France. Oh, so quite small. It is very small. It's often called the smallest African country, mm. which I did check that and it's not because all of the others are there are it's the sixth smallest African country but all of the top five are island nations like the Seychelles uh, rather than oh, being on okay. mainland Africa so it's the smallest mainland African country I think you can say safely so it is teeny though it is very small it's got a population of two million people uh, and in France terms that's a, a Lyon who oh, is it yeah <laughs> <laughs> the city of Lyon <laughs> yeah okay uh, it's got a flag as these places tend to it's got three horizontal stripes a red a blue and green band and those are separated by thin white lines okay this is from 1965 their independence and the blue is the Gambia River the red is the sun and the savannah the little white stripes are unity and peace and the green is the forest and agriculture mm. uh, fairly classic symbolism on the flag there yeah there was interestingly a in Luxembourg in 2013 an election where the three parties party coalition had the same colors each of the parties had the same colors as the gambian flag and it became known as the gambia coalition oh really so i guess the luxembourgians are much more familiar with gambian flags than <laughs> I would. wouldn't have been the thing that leapt to mind for me but there we yeah. go so obviously they have a national anthem they do this is called for the gambia our homeland yes uh, and i think we should have a little listen okay this is not an anthem that's in a rush it's not is it quite peaceful as well yeah it's got a kind of colliery band feel to it it does it does quite choral oh this is where it yeah it just kicked in off. <laughs> it's nice I like that one yeah sure it's, it's not a national anthem. my top three, but it's a, a very pleasant listen, I would say. I would agree. Right, so there's actually a story in this song because it's kind of the story of Africa in microcosm as well because there's a little bit of a debate as to who wrote it. 1965, in the independence I mentioned before, there was a national anthem selection committee set up to accept submissions for a new national anthem. That This committee had three submissions. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, anyone who had a, a tune in their head probably should have thrown their hat in the ring. They had a good chance at that kind of level. <laughs> Uh, but one of them was allegedly from a Mandinka musician, Mandinka being one of the tribes. Okay. Or the peoples, I guess you'd say. Uh, Jali Nyama Suso. Uh, and it was based on a traditional Mandinka song, apparently. And his proposal was recorded and the Prime Minister liked it and the Governor General liked it. So then it was translated into English because, I guess, those were the times. And this was translated by a guy called Jeremy Frederick Howe, who was the chairman of the selection committee. And nowadays, Howe and his wife, Virginia... Mm are credited as the creators of the anthem. Oh. So thanks for that, African people. We'll uh, call it something we did. That sounds okay. very much like the story of Africa to me in national anthem form. Having a chairman of a selection committee where you've only got three to select from, that sounds like there are more people on the committee than there are actually taking part. You feel like they spent longer working on their terms of reference than they did listening to national anthems, yeah. don't you? Yeah. I wonder what the other two are now, to be honest with you. I wonder yeah. if they lost to the history, who knows? Do you remember in, when we talked about Senegal, that I talked about the West African CFA franc that seven, eight different countries in West Africa all use as a sort of West African euro? Oh yeah, vaguely. I remember now, yeah. Yeah. The Gambians didn't want that. They have their own currency the Dalassi okay and I couldn't for the life of me find why they particularly didn't want to do that which <laughs> when you consider they're this tiny country in a country surrounded by Nigeria Ghana these really yeah. large economies I was really surprised but they they stuck with their Dalassi and they're 
they're hanging on. Uh, the capital city is Banjul, which is right on the mouth of the River Gambia. So the, the coast, the, the opening of the river, right on the edge there there's, on an island, there's capital city Banjul. I mean, to be fair, it sounds like everything is pretty much near the river. Yes, you, you don't get far from the river without <laughs> not being in Gambia anymore. It's yeah. true. But this is the mouth of the river, so you get a combination of ocean and river. Okay, like oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, this was previously called Bathurst after Henry Bathurst, the Secretary of State for the British Colonies. Of course. Uh, changed in 1973 because nobody wants a capital city that sounds like a butler. Yeah. Uh, Jeeves Town. <laughs> exactly, right? It's like, yeah, I think we're done with this. What's more surprising to me is it took them till 73. If they had independence in 65, they took their time changing that. Yeah. Maybe had to work on the signage. Yeah, there's a lot of signs to change. <laughs> yeah. uh, they make their money from tourism. It's a sunny destination, obviously. It's relatively Euro accessible being on the West Coast, quite north for an African nation. What are tourists doing? It's climate, look, got lovely beaches, apparently. Oh, right. Um, also, really, really good bird watching. So a lot of bird watchers go there, apparently. And another significant factor, apparently, is tracing of routes, because this was the location where a lot of the slaves were originated from. Okay. So what you get is a lot of African-Americans coming over to trace their heritage back. Of course, West Africa. Yeah. West Africa. And in particular, Kunta Kinte. Kunta Kinte is the original slave, if you will, in the Alex Haley novel and serialization Roots. Oh, okay. So right. Alex Haley wrote Roots based on his journey to discover his own past. He travelled to the uh, village in Gambia, in the Gambia, sorry, and met a griot. We met griots, a sort of historian, oral historian, storyteller. And he traced his origins back to this guy, Kunta Kinte, and he wrote the novel Roots that tells the story of seven generations of uh, people from the original slave who was taken away from his village to Alex Haley, right? Mm, I'm going to check it out. So famous Gambians. Fatou Ben Souda. Okay. Yeah, I didn't. I hadn't heard of them either, but then I felt embarrassed that I hadn't because it's a lawyer who brings war criminals to justice in the International Criminal Court. Oh, wow. Uh, in 2012, she was listed in the Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Wow, that's incredible. Right? So, yeah, we, we'd have known if she was an actress or a footballer, but uh, <laughs> human rights lawyers are not on our radar as perhaps they should be. They should be, absolutely. We must do all we can to ensure that security, stability and the protective embrace of the law become a reality to be relished by all in all corners of the world. Our responsibilities remain great indeed, but our resolve must endure. Each of you in his own or her own way with the knowledge that taking bold and meaningful action through the vector of the law to protect citizenry from the scourge of war and mass violence demonstrates leadership, not weakness. Let us imagine a world with and a world without an independent, impartial international criminal court. And then we ask ourselves the question, which of the two advances the forward march for humanity, with or without? Uh, and one other person who I knew to my enormous self-satisfaction, but you might not, Jay Huss. Jay Huss. Jay Huss, of born to Gambian parents in London, in fairness, is a rapper. Okay. He's a pioneer in the genre Afro Swing. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you... <laughs> Do you know Jay Huss? Because he did a song called Must Be, which was really big a year or two ago. Um, okay. And I, I mean, you're so clued in to I, it, the rap scene. I, I don't know why I know it, to be honest with you, but I do. So when I was like, ah, yeah, I know Jay Huss. Yeah. The rapper. The rapper. Yeah, yeah, no problem. The rapper. I'm fully aware of him. Thank the you very musician. Much. <laughs> Yeah. So yes, uh, he is of Gambian descent, so I thought I'd throw him into the mix. You just want some credibility points with <laughs> the kids. Tell the kids that I knew who Jay is. Probably <laughs> old news now. Literally. Yeah. Uh, Gambia facts. <gasps> Yay! Well, these aren't Gambia facts. These are Gambia top tips for your Boo. visit there, Brian. <laughs> well, they are facts. Okay. Yay! But they are also tips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Do not try and buy a razor at night. Uh, okay. Shopkeeper will not sell you a razor at night. It's bad luck. Really? Yeah. What if I gave them double the money? Well, I don't know how. I, I'm not clear on who gets the bad luck. I suspect if you get the bad luck, they'll be like, yeah, fair enough. But I suspect if they're selling it, then it's the bad luck falls on them. Yeah. I think we just, let's just leave the razor business. Shave what in the morning. I need right? to shave. <laughs> I need it now. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Um, you must never answer the door to someone late at night, especially if they're looking for a razor. Well, it's well, it just sounds like good advice to me, to be honest with you, <laughs> rather than anything particularly uh, superstitious. But apparently, that, that's bad juju. You can ward off bad luck though by pouring water outside your door. How much? doesn't specify i would start with a glass and work your way up if you're still feeling unlucky just a little dribble just yeah and eventually a whole bath load if you're feeling like (laughs) you've got a lot of bad luck to expunge uh you live in a flat rind so yeah (laughs) i'm not sure you might bring more bad luck onto yourself by pouring water down the corridor (laughs) you just have to take your chances with the spirits or just a thimble and hope that works you must never visit someone who is bereaved on a saturday now there's two ways of reading that i'm i believe it's if someone's bereaved you shouldn't visit them on a saturday yeah that's how rather than if someone's bereaved on a saturday day you okay. never visit them <laughs> which seems a little bit harsh that seems a little harder uh, yeah i wasn't clear as to why that was the case but uh that's the rule apparently okay well th- there's a lot of rules here there is and i've got one more for you which is dreaming of a snake means impending pregnancy i haven't had a dream about a snake recently so i think i'm probably okay and you're not pregnant there you go so introduction to the gambia <laughs> Right, a little bit of quick history. Do you want a little rundown of how we got to where we are today? Yeah, I want to know how it started. Yes, well, uh, unsurprisingly, there's very little known about the area in early, early days because it is, as we know, an oral tradition. So there aren't huge archives of things to read to tell us about it. But we do know that Arab traders used to cross the Sahara into the region for trade, especially wanting the gold that is in the area. And we know there was an ever flow of empires from the 1200s, before the 1200s even. Uh, the Sosa Empire was an empire in the area. And this is broadly West Africa rather than specifically the Gambia. Uh, It's all a bit vague as to where exactly everything happened, but there was the Mali Empire from 1200s to the 1600s. It was a massive empire in West Africa. The Kabu Empire in the 1530s to the 1860s or thereabouts. And the the point of all these is, certainly for me, my traditional and old-fashioned view of Africa or the sort of received image I have in my head is of individual villages just going about their business. And you don't have a sense of these larger kingdoms that actually existed so there were empires that were ebbing and flowing and it wasn't just villages getting on with their own isolated lives there was this people invading people traveling between areas claiming areas and it's a very similar story to what we see in europe but we just never or i personally never think about africa in that kind of a way it's actually more a lot more lively than than we would have expected absolutely it's a, a lot more lively and a lot more sophisticated in terms mm. of there is a government there is a tax there is trade there is all these things that not just people in villages milking the cows and drinking their I was say cow tea. juice but i guess milk i suppose <laughs> but then of course in 1446 somebody arrives would you care to take a guess yes i would like to guess i'm going to go with the portuguese correct nuno tristal made contact with the inhabitants of senegal in this case but he hears there's gold in that Dar river the of gambia course. river uh he sends a venetian called luis de cadamosto to take a ship in search of the river and they find the river in 1455 and trootle upstream a little bit they try and establish some settlements but it never quite takes a lot of people die of disease and things they, they give it a go but they never quite really establish but the word gambia comes from portuguese cambio meaning oh. trade or you know, exchange so 1588 a guy called antonio the prior of crato who was someone who's claiming the throne of portugal sold london and devon merchants the right to trade between the rivers senegal and gambia so this is where the british start to get interested in the region what are they trading gold and ivory and slaves come out Mm -hmm. what goes in i believe is iron guns and tools and things like that right so the french are also in senegal so in this region you've now got portuguese french and british we see a few attempts to explore the area for trade purposes but nothing really quite takes off at this period so busy yeah so busy because in even busier in 1660 when the reports of a gold mine in the upper reaches of the uh, river reach the english ears Mm. and the english become involved as well and they set up something called the company of royal adventurers trading into africa Africa. So 1677 begins a century, really, to century and a half of England and France bickering about who owns Senegambia. As we know today, Senegal is a French-speaking nation and the Gambia is an English-speaking nation. So right. you have a rough idea of how that went down. So they eventually make peace with France, and it, but it's still just a few settlements and bases, not really a explored, exploited colony at this point. There's some suggestion that London cede the Gambia to France for other bits of West Africa, but the Gambians apparently put up a bit of a fight at that time, and this is back in 1861. Okay. So the, there was quite a voice of the Gambians. I suspect 
suspect it was the trading and elite Gambians rather than your average common or garden Gambian. But nevertheless, they were uh, made, made a big fuss because the people suggesting it were quite keen on saying, well, actually, you take the Gambian, we'll take another chunk of West Africa. In World War One, the Gambia Company served alongside British troops in the Cam- Cameroon campaign. Okay, good for them. So they did their bit. In 1920, there was a National Congress of British West Africa formed, and this was an organisation working towards African emancipation and independence. Just to give you a rough idea of the Gambia as a small representative, the Gambian delegation to the National Congress of British West Africa was small. It was one man called Edward Small. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> he was the delegation. <laughs> so it was small. It was small indeed. In World War II, the Gambians fought for Britain again, this time in Burma, and the country itself became an important base. It hosted the RAF in various ways, and obviously being on that part of the coast with Dakar, just up the coast, it was quite strategic as well. And then we've seen this time and time again, after the war, it's the road to independence. Uh, Everyone says, well, well, now we've fought and died, and what's this really all about? Uh, We see the agreement between the British and the Gambian. I didn't see much in the way of violence type of struggle just okay. more is shaking of hands and saying well you're going to go your own way in 1965 uh, and they were still in the commonwealth at that point so it seems to be relatively friendly uh, they have a prime minister called Sir Dorda Kairaba Jawara he stays in charge for quite a long time in 1981 there's a coup attempt by uh, Kukoi Samba Sanyang who tried to get elected twice failed so he just runs a coup instead that doesn't work the Senegalese come and help out so there's this ongoing relationship with the Senegalese here it's interesting isn't it because we see that quite a lot the minute that the colonizers leave is then there's like this power struggle of well who's gonna take control absolutely there's no that it's not like a sudden everyone yay okay we're all together now and we all agree we all agree yeah <laughs> and, and it's a sudden transition isn't it you're suddenly gone from these guys telling you what to do to you guys decide it's not going to be smooth sailing how long did it take democracy to embed and gradually emerge in the uk which is why you see coups happening because the military have a power in a time of confusion and are able to sort of step in and assert their authority. Absolutely. And in this case, it was the Senegalese troops who had the power oh. and they were pals with the powers that be, so the coup failed. And then there was a treaty in 1982 called the Senegambia Confederation. And this was an aim to really massively increase the ties between Senegal and the Gambia, combine their armed forces, unify their economies, have the same currency. Apparently this was driven more by the elites. The everyday people didn't really care too much. But eventually it didn't come they didn't succeed in 1989 the gambia actually withdrew from what i can make out it's mostly because of a sense that they would be lost and swallowed up by senegal rather than just be trading might they'd actually just get swallowed up and disappear culturally well that's been on the back of my mind since you started mentioning about how they're right slap bang in the center of senegal it, it it's, how have they not been subsumed yeah i i guess it's it, it was close and they didn't in the end <laughs> it's all yeah. i can say it sort of makes sense it's like but then it's looks like one country it's inside a country you can only get anywhere by going through senegal or you'd think that river would be an attractive feature for the senegalese you'd think but they do they still have had hundreds of years of being separate so on the one hand it's driven by the elites but they're also the people who kind of stand up to lose something because you go from being the big fish in a small pond to a small fish in a much bigger pond so i guess on reflection they thought it wasn't worth it and they decided to back out yeah so your man jawara the same guy still in charge until 1994 he gets re-elected five times in 1994 there's another coup led by Lieutenant Yaya Jame. It's more of a mutiny against a complacent and corrupt government than a coup. It was completely bloodless. Nobody was killed. But he does then ban opposition and he rules at the head of a military council for two years. So in 1996, they have some democratic elections. Now, you're never going to guess who wins that. Same guy, Jamie. Right. <laughs> he's, got, he's, he's gone from, no, it's all right. I'm only in charge in a military capacity for two years and then we'll have a vote and guess who everyone voted for in inverted commas? Okay. Him. Uh, there was some criticism that the elections may not have been fair. Oh, really? I know, you're shocked. I am shocked because I thought that all elections were fair. You would hope, wouldn't you? But uh, dare to dream, one day they will be. Yeah. Uh, in 2016, there was another election and the opposition candidate, a guy called Adama Barrow, he won. Well done him. So Jamie then said, no. He said, no, I'm not recognising that. He refuses to leave office. He declares a state of emergency. The emergency in question being, I'm going to lose my job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, Barrow, the guy who won, flees to Senegal again. The United Nations tells Jamey, come on, man, you lost. Uh, and so does the Economic Community of West African States, or 
ECOWAS. 15 different West African states come together and they launch Operation Restore Democracy. Is that what it was called? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. They send 7,000 troops of various countries to enforce the election, basically saying, so are you going to stand down or not? Wow, that's bold. It was bold. So there's a couple of days of fighting and then Jame stands down. And by stands down, I mean... Flees the country. Oh, I thought you were going to say he was killed. But yeah. okay. So Barrow returns to Gambia and he takes office and he's the president of Gambia today, re-elected in 2021. Wow, that's amazing. It's not often you see that. Yeah, that felt like a really successful international operation, to be honest with you. And it was done by West Africans. It wasn't just imposed by some uh, nation thousands of miles away. Yeah. And it was to restore, genuinely restore democracy. So it felt like, when I was reading about it, quite an interesting period that unfortunately isn't our time period. Otherwise, I would have loved to dig into that. I would like to suggest that they change the name, though, of the operation. Oh, go on. They should have called it. (laughs) (laughs) I'm on the edge of my seat here. (laughs) Operation. (laughs) Operation Get Out. Operation Get Out. Better, isn't it? Operation Get Out. (laughs) Operation Clear Off You. (laughs) Well, uh, next time they have a coup, I will send you down to help them with their marketing. Yeah. Operation Vote Boat. (laughs) Oh, my Lord. I'm trying to think of something like, it's just something more fun than Operation Democracy. True. But speaking of Vote Boat, uh, interestingly, in the Gambia... (laughs) Vote Boat. I know, really. They don't use paper ballots. They conduct the elections using marbles. So you get a marble and you drop your marble into a tube in a drum. This sounds fun. And then you count the marbles at the end. You don't have paper ballots. Oh, so it doesn't spin around like, like a marble maze. <laughs> I, I, that would add a little zip, zip to the election, wouldn't it? Donk, yeah. Donk, donk. Donk, donk, donk. Watching it go all the way down. Which hole will it drop through? Like a pachinko pan. <gasps> Who have I voted for? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Like three holes at the bottom and it like hits pins on the way down. Which one am I going to vote? Oh, I voted for the wrong so guy. Once again, you have a lot to offer the Gambians in their next election. So Give me a call. Yeah. He's ready. He's ready to come, guys. Yeah, anytime. <laughs> Okay, so making a breakthrough, Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, making a breakthrough means discovering something that wasn't discovered or achieving something that hadn't previously been achieved. Yeah, in my mind, it's like pushing things forward, a discovery that helps move things along. Right. And suddenly as well, not necessarily gradually. Well, as you know, the history of this area has always been an oral tradition, so it's quite difficult to tell what happened pre the arrival of the colonialists. Okay. This also tends to give us a bit of a Eurocentric viewpoint because the writings that we do have are from visitors, not from local people. Sure. So we are stuck with a little bit of a mystery for how to describe what happens in the Gambia, 1300 to 1400. So I started researching and a little bit of a heavy heart, I realised that the real question today is whether I would make a breakthrough Ah. and find something to talk about. (laughs) (laughs) But let's see what we found. So in the 5th century BC, a little earlier than our time, it's believed that uh, there's a Carthaginian, Carthage is sort of North Africa, Tunisia today. Okay. Um, uh, a Carthaginian had possibly visited this area, a guy called Hanno the Navigator. Uh, he wrote That's an account another of his journey. I know, they're navigating all the time. Uh, he wrote an account of his journey, or actually technically a periplus. Oh, what's that? I didn't know this. Is your word of today, periplus. This is a document that lists the ports and coastal landmarks in order with approximate distances along a shore. Okay, periplus. That's a great word, isn't it? It's very good. Uh, sadly, the original Periplus, written in the Carthaginian, I suppose, is lost, but we do have a Greek translation, albeit from a thousand years later. Ugh, not entirely reliable. That's actually quite a long time, isn't it? There is a very long time. But there is a belief that he got as far as Senegambia in his journey around. He certainly got to Morocco, uh, and we think he might have got to Senegambia. And when he gets to possibly Senegambia, he encounters a wild, hairy people, and he gave them a name, meaning hairy person, Gorillae. And that's where we obviously get the word for the gorilla that we know today. Wait, was the gorilla named before? Like, was he aware of gorillas? No, I think the, this this was the first use of gorilla that was then utilised when gorillas, as we know them, to name the gone. ape. Okay. Yeah, so could this be the Cambia? Am I going to make a breakthrough? Mm. Ooh, it's on an island that he found these gorilla. So we're not on an island, so that's probably not it. And it's well oh. before my time. So. All right. Okay, let's try again. Okay. <laughs> we're going to do it this time. For a long time, the Sahara Desert was a huge barrier. It was a, almost a sea, a dry sea, mm. barely get across it. But in the 7th century, camel trade started to cross the Sahara to access the gold fields of West Africa. People love gold. They do love it, right? This, this starts the international trans-Saharan cultural and economic exchange. 
Uh, this is gold coming from south to north and salt in particular coming from north to south. People love salt too. People love a bit of salt. Mm. And it's surprising because today gold is still the benchmark for value and salt is a very everyday substance. It's like the most everyday substance. Uh, so yeah, just think how time's changed. One day someone will have, there'll be so much gold due to a meteorite mm. crash that people will treat it like tinfoil. And people will be traveling for thousands of miles to get themselves a teaspoon of salt. Salt, let's get your salt here. Yeah, salt for sale. I've got rock salt, table salt, sea salt, bath salt, salt for all. Excuse get me. Get your salt here. Excuse me, my people. They are parched. Do you have any water? Oh, it's funny. Everyone asks that. No, sir. I'm a salt seller. A salt seller? Yeah, I sell salt. I'm not a dispenser, although I do sell a few salt sellers too. Nice little sideline. But you're in the middle of the driest place for a thousand miles. Only a madman would set up a salt stall in such a place. Do you know what? You sound just like my ex-wife. Do you want any salt then? What? No, I, I'm thirsty. I'll do you a cracking deal. I don't need salt. My men, they're dehydrated. They're camels. They're dying of thirst. They do look like they've got the ump. Hey! Why would anyone buy salt? Well, I'm glad you asked. Salt is a miracle. You can put it on your chips. It'll liven even the blandest soup. And you can even de-ice your driveway with it. Ice? Where would I even find ice to put salt on? You know, I had a load of ice just last week. Thing is, I sold it all to some passing Eskimos. Anyway, um, in this trade, most of the merchants coming across from north to south were Muslims, Arabs and Berbers. We've met them in various of the previous podcasts. We have, yeah. Oh, I think we met them in Mauritania and I think we met them in Algeria. Anyway, these guys, they, well, they didn't just show up, pack their bags and go away again. They would establish small colonies on the other side of the Sahara. And as people do, tend to intermarry with local African aristocracy. And then these descendants of these merchants develop a new social class in Mali, as the area is known at this time, the Mali Empire is happening. It's quite interesting because these guys take on the Islam of the traveling Berbers and traders. Yeah. But they also don't necessarily want to give up their indigenous animist beliefs. So animist beliefs are spirits in things, more or less. So they sort of what merge the two? Absolutely. So they solve this quite in a, quite an ingenious way. So we believe that Allah is the God, the high God, and you only worship Allah. But you don't want to give up these deities. So the solution is in genies or jinn. So jinn apparently are discussed in the Quran. So they exist as this concept of supernatural entities. They're unseen spirits, nature spirits. So you could combine your African beliefs by saying, I believe in this river God. The river God becomes a river genie. And that way you can reconcile your Quranic beliefs which says genie exist you go ah oh, right so what was a god is now a genie and i can actually say i believe in all these things and i don't have to give anything up that's great uh, i love how things move on and adapt it's good isn't it it's it's nice to see that uh, you didn't just chuck it away wholesale and you found a way to accommodate your it just goes to show you can find a way to accommodate various apparently conflicting beliefs Imagine being a local to uh, Senegambia at that time, and then these strangers from literally the opposite side of what must have felt like the world just appear on these strange camel creatures with weird spices and stories about the world. I mean, um, we've talked about this before, crazy. haven't we? Because the only because the world at large has been discovered now. Frankly, mm. the only things I can imagine happening is either something emerges from the very depths of the sea, <laughs> yeah. or aliens land. That's the right. only equivalent that that has that element of the absolute unknown just appearing on your doorstep. The suddenness of it. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, how do we know all this about these beliefs and the Arabs and the Wikipedia. West Africans? Well, that's how I knew about it. <laughs> but how did it get to Wikipedia? Well, let's meet Ibn Battuta. Okay. We've actually met before, believe it or not, in right. the Uzbekistan episode. Mm. Ibn Batuta was a melon fan who described the deliciousness of melons. He was the guy I described as a kind of Moroccan Marco Polo. Oh, yes, you did mention him. And actually, I have to admit, I did him dirty because I called him a uh, Moroccan Marco Polo. He knocks Marco Polo into a cocked hat in terms of his travel. <laughs> he went about 117,000 kilometers to Marco Polo's 24,000. Wait, that's a lot more. He went everywhere. This guy was remarkable. So Ibn Battuta might be the man to help me make a breakthrough. Okay, uh, great. Let's do it, Ibn. So in 1350, promising, that's in our right. time period, uh, he sets out to visit the Mali Empire. 
Okay, so this is his final voyage, actually. So he'd previously gone to Uzbekistan for the melons, as we know, and various other places. But this is his final journey. So he joins one of these trading caravans with all the camels. He says the average size for the caravans was a thousand camels, with some of them being as large as 12,000 camels long. 12,000 camels, all camels. in one train, exactly. traveling from one side of Africa to the other. It's like a continuous conveyor belt of camels almost, isn't it? You can only imagine them stopping at some point, like on a on an oasis, to try and get some water and rest, imagine sucking the, the thing dry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so these guys will be guided by uh, Berbers, who are the nomads who know the desert much better than anyone else but it was still a precarious business so the caravans couldn't carry enough water for their legs so what would happen was the caravan would set out and then between sources lighter runners would leg it to the next oasis to gather up a bunch of water to bring back to the caravan so that they could make it from one oasis to the other there's a single point of failure in that isn't there that runner yeah yes they're very much depending on that runner to come back with a big bag of water (laughs) because if he doesn't everyone else dies uh, pretty much, yeah. I think that's how that would go down. I think there's probably more than one of them, so some fail safes, a bit of mitigation wow. of your risk. But uh, yeah, this is was... this is the sad part about this kind of history when none of this is written down. I know that. Yeah, the 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 sense of lost stories is really overwhelming. Mm. The water runner returns. Allah be praised. We are saved. You're right, lads. Water runner, how good it is to see you, and just in time too. I fear we could not hold out much longer. Did you find the oasis? Yep, yep. Loaded up on fresh, delicious, thirst-quenching water. Mm -mm. Great work, my child. Abdullah, open the crates. Right away, sire. Wait, what is this? This this isn't water. This is... This is salt. Yeah, yeah. No, on the way back, I met this salt seller, and he offered me a cracking deal. But in the case of Ibn Battuta, he makes it to the Mali Empire, which, as we know, or I'm about to tell you, the Mali Empire includes the Gambia. Yay! So we did it. No, we didn't. Okay. Ibn Battuta says the people of the region possess many admirable qualities. They are seldom unjust and have a greater abhorrence of injustice than any other people. There is complete security in their country. Wow, that's great. Uh, You might not have said that if you're one of the slaves that they were trading at the time, but uh, nevertheless, your mileage may vary. So is Ibn Battuta going to be my breakthrough? No, because he does visit the Empire of Mali, of which the Gambia is a part. He does it at the right time, around about 1350. Right. But the Gambia is the far, far west of the Empire. Obviously, it hits the coast. Battuta never gets closer than about 900 miles, 1500 kilometers away. That's pretty close. Close, but not close enough for me. It's not, no. So... What about the Mali Empire? Well, I find my breakthrough in the Mali Empire somewhere. Before the 1200s, the traders appeared to mostly be doing business with the Soso or Susu Empire in West Africa. And then the early 1200s, you see the rise of the Mali Empire. That is the roots of the Gambian people as well, actually, it turns out. The empire stretches from the coast of Semna Gambia all the way to a place called Gao, which is about 1700 kilometers inland. And for once, we actually have a story here. We've got a legendary story called the Epic of Sundiata, which tells the story of the founder of the kingdom of Mali. Could this be the breakthrough, Ryan? Probably not. (laughs) Well, it's an epic poem from the oral tradition, i.e. not written down, but it has been written down since. During the 1890s, French officials wrote down the story. Okay. And it's told, obviously, from storyteller to storyteller. The storyteller historians, though, known as Griot, we've met Griot before, these storytellers. Yeah. Um, the fr- that's Griot is the French word, so I'm going to call them Jali. Jali is the preferred alternative in the Gambia. Uh, these guys are the keepers of history and lineage. They have a re- an important role in the community. They're also kind of a minstrel. They sing and they, they're performers, and it's a skill that's passed from father to son. These are significant roles in the community. Uh, and you might remember that uh, in the Senegal episode, we mentioned that because they're different and important and these repositories of knowledge, they get buried not in the ground with people but they get buried in baobab trees yeah so these are griot or jali as i'm going to call them as i say uh, and the jali would sing this song the epic of sundiata i want to be buried in a tree just letting you know all right i'll i'll make sure that happens yeah not like a small tree i don't want to be like having my arms <laughs> hanging out the top a sapling <laughs> 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 that's giving me an image that i can't get out of my head now <laughs> right so epic of sundiata sundiata founds the empire of mali the gambia is part of the empire of mali but sundiata Keita lived 1215 to 1255 he's 50 years before our chosen period you're you're 
It's so close. I know, right? So maybe we won't have a breakthrough. So let's just talk a bit about life. What do we know about life? We know a little bit about life, how people lived in the area. So let's visit a Mandinka village in the 1300s, little upriver on the Gambia River. We're going to sample a bit of life there. Sounds great. Uh, Because history happened to ordinary people as well. It's not just kings and queens and emperors and victory. I'll be honest, that's more the stuff I'm interested in, Pete. Right, well, good news. (laughs) So the Gambia was home to lots of people. We met these in uh, the Senegal episode as well, the Serer, the Wolof people, the Fula, the Jola. And they've all got their own identities and customs. But rather than try and mix them all up, I've just picked one and we're going to talk about the Mandinka today. Okay. So first off, we're going to visit a village. So where exactly is our village? Um, by they, the river. Ah, well, you'd think by the river, but no, your village will not be by the river. Ah. Why is that? Number one, you've got crocodiles and hippos in the river. But much worse than that, the river actually has a floodplain and that floodplain through the, the rainy season, the wet season, is a swampy mess. So if you were right, right by the river, half of the year you'd be up to your ankles in water anyway. Fighting off crocs and hippos. So, But you don't want to be too far away. So you're right to want to be near that source of water. So what you'll find is our village will be placed on the rising slope just above the floodplain okay uh it'll be circular mud huts with grass roofs which um i don't like the phrase mud huts mud huts brings to mind again a sort of primitivism but when you think about it a, a brick is merely mud in a rectangle right? <laughs> and a thatched roof is a grass roof right so we say mud hut with a grass roof but actually you could describe it as a thatched single brick dwelling <laughs> yeah but anyway on the floodplains you're in a good spot now because you've got floodplains on one side and uplands drier uplands on the other so in the floodplains you can grow rice bananas vegetables and you can tap trees for palm oil you go to the palm trees okay so everything uh, a, a person needs everything a person needs now i was surprised because rice right i thought rice is asian essentially yeah and, i did too uh, i was I surprised thought, when you said rice right yeah so th- so i was taken by this and i checked and actually it turns out there are two species of cultivated rice in the world asian rice and african rice no way so african rice is actually native to sub-saharan africa Thought to have been domesticated by people living in West Africa about two or 3,000 years ago. Wow, that's amazing. Right? So recently it's been replaced by the Asian rice generally, but the, the Asian species were brought in by the Portuguese in the 16th century. But, you know, back in the day there was African rice cultivated by the local people, particularly the Jola people apparently were rice growers, but also the Mandinka. And that means rice was in the area. We know that it was cultivated by people. We know that in modern Mandinka villages they do cultivate rice. And actually there's a gender split. Women grow the rice uh, and the men grow the millet. Uh, so I'm going to say we've, we're going to have rice in our area. They also grow vegetables, so things like black-eyed peas and okra, or ladies' fingers as they're also known. Mm-hmm. And they were all new discoveries when Europeans arrived to West Africa, new new foods that they hadn't come across. And um, we've also got palm oil. This is a red-orange liquid that I think we've, we've encountered before. Uh, it's used as a source base for a lot of Gambian dishes. And it comes from Af- the, the African oil palm. And that's you have to go up to the top of the tree and you find a fruit and you squeeze it and then the oil comes out, I guess. And it's very oily and it's, it's delicious. I mean, it, it does give an incredible taste. And to the food stains everything orange stains everything <laughs> orange <laughs> And uh, uh, it's now grown in an unsustainable way exactly so which damages the environment yes and so try and avoid having palm oil absolutely although we will not avoid having palm oil in the very near future ryan because i have got a dish for you the <gasps> red orange oil is used in a cooking a local gambian dish called super kanja Super ganja. Super kanja. Oh, kanja. Kanja. So ok- that's okra stew, right? Soup as in super as in soup rather than okay. fantastic. That's from the Portuguese for soup, sopa. And the African word kanja is for okra. So that's what we're going to eat tonight. I've made you some. This is uh, super kanja. It's simmering as we speak. Ooh. Uh, let's prepare you a bowl and I will explain it as we munch. Okay. Presenting West African Side Story. All your favourite hits in one incredible album, featuring... When you're a croc, you're a croc All the way from the day that you hatch To the time you decay When you're a croc, better eat what you can From a small river rat to a Gambian man For just $9.99 on compact disc or double-length cassette, including... I want to live in the Gambia, wallow in lovely mud here, keep all my hippoey friends near, everything good in the Gambia. Not sold in stores, so buy now and receive this one-time exclusive offer of a free West African side story commemorative salt cellar. Right. 
So I've made you a nice, I've made this, by the way, yeah. a nice bowl of super kanja. Super kanja fragilistic expialidocious. So there's a little bit of catfish, okay. uh, <laughs> beef, okra, palm oil, onions, and salt and pepper. Right. Uh, boiled, it's not fried or roasted. Yep. Uh, there's a little bit of rice there. And uh, have a little taste, see how Okay, all right. That's that distinct African taste that we've we've tried before. It does. I think that's the palm oil that really that yeah, that that's comes probably through. it. It's really distinctive. Okra, ladies' fingers, so named because ladies' fingers are green and horrible and Boy. knobbly and taste bad. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. I'm used to spicy foods, and it's got a kind of blandness to it. Yeah, it's a the very only subtle spices taste. are salt and pepper in that. Yeah. Yeah, there's no kick to it. It's just a very stable Sunday food, I would refer to that as. I think so. It's, And I'm sure there were nicer versions. That was my first go. So. <laughs> no, I think it's very wholesome. I'm sure it's very good for you. All right. So uh, whilst you're eating, I will continue. So that was the the floodplains had the palm and the vegetables and the... Crocodiles. The crocodiles and the rice. Mm. Right, but then the uplands and the women... And you asked why the women and the men were separated and the women grow the rice and the men grow the milk. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's because they go, have to go to different places to do it. The the uplands, the drier areas, is where the dry crops, the millet, sorghum, peanuts, they're all grown on the uplands. So someone has to be up and someone has to be down, I guess. So they just okay. split it by gender is my assumption. That makes sense. Maybe the women need to be closer to the village because of the families. Maybe, or they just... Men go uh, further. Braver and when it comes to crocodiles and things. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> now, in our period, there were no peanuts because the Portuguese brought the peanut to Africa from Brazil in the 1600s or thereabouts. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't know that. Okay, I thought they were native. But sorghum probably is there. It originated in Africa. It's been found in an archaeological dig in uh, the Egyptian-Sudanese border about 8,000 BC. Uh, it grows in most warm climates. You can There's tons of uses for it. The grain sorghums are for food. Grass sorghums can be used for hay and fodder for animals. And broom corn is used to make brooms and brushes. So... How come we're not using sorghum so much now? It's, by all accounts, not all that tasty-wise. <laughs> oh. No, but it sounds like you can use it for lots of other things. How am I not wearing sorghum pants? That is a good question. I'm As a little that. throwback to <laughs> those that yeah. listened to early episodes. Yeah. Um, millet also has origins in Africa. Pearl millet was domesticated in the Sahel region of West Africa three and a half thousand years ago. So we've got our dinner, we've got our crops, we've got our village, but our village needs to be organised. And the system of governing in the Mandinka tradition had three layers. They had the family level, where the eldest male member of a household is in charge. They had the village level, where the head of the village was the oldest member of the family who established the village so whoever got there first and said i'm setting this village up gotcha. the oldest member of that family is in charge of the village that they, makes sense yeah but they they don't just rule with an iron fist they they have a village council of elders that they consult with as well mm -hmm. uh, but then at the state level there is a mansa or a chief for a whole area and that's where you would see that the mansa of the empire of mali would be the king of mali effectively go see the mansa exactly so we, we've now got our families, we're in the village, we've got a meal, we've settled down, maybe have a bit of palm wine, you don't know. We settle down to eat on a mat. To, even today, they do, they'll sit on a mat, they eat from a large single shared bowl with food in the middle, uh, and you sit around it and you can take a little bit of meat or vegetables from, and, and rice from the centre and you bring it to your area of the plate. So it's a shared plate, okay. but you don't just eat out of the centre, you take bits from the centre and move it to your, to your area. You, Ryan, being a foreigner, would probably have someone pushing stuff onto your area to hmm. give you something to eat as well. Okay. Now it's story time, and we all look to the Jali, aka the Griot from earlier. Yep. Uh, the keeper of the stories to entertain us. So, as we said, the storytellers and musicians and praise singers, they're also diplomats and intermediaries. So, they often represent tribal chiefs as well. And they're also masters of ceremony in, in a lot of ways. So, they do naming ceremonies and marriages. But they also tell stories, uh, particularly histories. So Ajali is going to tell us a story. Cool. Uh, but before he does, hang on, he's got a friend and his friend's a musician who's playing a very interesting instrument called the Kora. So the bards tell us stories about the Kora, this instrument, as having many origins, but they all of the, the stories that have the uh, have the common factor that the instrument comes from the genies, the djinn. The oh, djinn so the it's a magical instrument. Magical instrument. Magical instrument. Uh, and one of the stories goes that once upon a time, a Jali named Fowling Sisiko went to the city of Gabu, which is now in Guinea-Bissau, just south of our area. And he heard about a mysterious lake called Sanamentin, home to a genie, a djinn. Uh, he goes to the lake and he makes a wish of the djinn. I want the best instrument in the world that no other Jali has ever seen. Greedy, but okay. Well, the spirit says something similar. Well, what's in it for me? Good question. Uh, the spirit says, how about your sister? 
Uh, <laughs> uh, that's his suggestion. Okay. Sissoko says, well, oh, I don't know about that. It seems a bit, a bit much in exchange for a, a banjo, basically. <laughs> and uh, so jolly fouling Sissiko uh, went back to his village. He explained to his sister, look, I don't want to do this. And she says, no. Got some news. Well... <laughs> She, she's the one who says, no, I'm, I'm going to do it. I okay. think this is a good trade-off. I don't know. Maybe she's a water lover. I don't know. She's aquatic. But she she's sick of him playing music. Yeah, maybe she's fed up with the guy. <laughs> but in any event, for whatever reason that possesses her, she goes to the lake and throws herself in. Okay. And then the next day, Jolly Fowling goes to the lake. He finds a strange and beautiful instrument, kind of a double harp. And the spirit appears and says, play. Right. So you can play now. Oh, okay. Play the pinky ping aura. Right. So the first reference to the Korah... Was twangy, made, isn't it? It is very twangy. Uh, so this is the Korah, harp-like instrument, first referred to in 1799 in a Scottish traveller's writing. This traveller I only included because I love his name, Mungo Park. Mungo Park. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of an African harp. It's a kind of an African harp. You hold it between your legs when you play it. Uh, it's got a big round base made of a calabash, big gourd. It's got a long straight neck of rosewood and strings coming down from the neck onto the body of the, the instrument, about 21 strings, made traditionally of thin, twisted antelope hide. And it's got a really wide range of notes. It's funny. If you'd have played that to me and said, where is this instrument from? I would have said like in India, uh, maybe? Really? I would have gone for medieval Austria or something. Okay. I had a, I had a medieval feel for it, but yeah. I was thinking sitar type thing. Oh yeah, no, I get that. So anyway, there is a reference to a stringed harp-like instrument in Ibn Battuta's writing as well, but generally they think that the Kora wasn't invented until probably the 18th century. Oh. Uh, and also, they're more associated with royalty and kings. This is a bit of a courtly instrument rather than uh, our bog-standard village that we're living in. I don't so, think it's beyond the wit of man to get a gourd and some string and pluck away at it. Well, it definitely isn't because, actually, there's a precursor to this instrument called the bolon or the bolon batter, which is kind of a variation of the kora with fewer strings. It's got much lower sound. It's much bassier, uh, five strings. And it, instead of a straight neck, it's got this bent neck that really looks a bit like a longbow. Okay. It's got a gourd again as the body, the resonator, with leather to help with the amplification. And uh, this is played by the Mandinga people in Gambia today. Uh, and it's supposed to have been present in our time period. Uh, it's described a bit more as an instrument of the people. So I think in our village, we're more likely to have one of these bolombatas playing. Yeah, me too. Uh, again, played holding between the legs, curve of the neck facing the player, and you pluck the, the strings with your thumbs, but you can also wrap with your knuckles or your fingers on the gourd to give you a bit of percussion noise as well. Cool. Why not? So, uh, this is the sound of the bolombata. So this is the sound of the bolombata. Okay. So they, they may have had one, or maybe the Jali's just going to tell us a story uh, without musical accompaniment. I don't know. So I'm going to have a little whisper to the Jali. I'm going to say, listen, Jali, mate, I, I need a breakthrough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing a podcast on the Gambia yeah. in the 1300s. Surely there's some history. It happened everywhere after all. Mm -hmm. And the Jali gives a little nod and a smile. Mm. And he says... I'll give you your breakthrough. Yes. And he begins to tell a tale. But I want your sister. Because <laughs> <laughs> I lost mine to get in exchange for this harmonica. <laughs> Jolly, how are you? Oh, hey, Jeannie. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Still got that instrument, eh? Yeah, yeah, I do. And how's that working out for you? It's not broken or anything. No, it's fine. Because, you know, if you were in any way unsatisfied, uh, we do have a no-questions-asked-returns policy. Oh, well, no, that's good to know, but actually I'm quite happy. You wouldn't say it was too complex, perhaps. You know, uh, too hard to play. No, nah, I've got to get rich with it now. Uh, it is heavy, though, isn't it? Strains the old back a bit. Well, a bit heavy, I guess, but it's not too bad. And the sound... I mean, it's rather... I mean, I don't want to say whiny, but... Uh, well, yeah, I suppose it's not for everybody. Exactly. You don't want to alienate your audience. Well, I, I guess so. And again, I would remind you, we do have that returns policy. Yeah, but, but it's used now. It's past 28 days as well. No! You are a valued customer. Really? Well, I'll 
Okay then, yeah, I guess I guess I could return it. Excellent. I mean, of course, I shall reimburse you uh, and return your sister. Oh wait, wait, no, 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 no. It's it's uh, fine. I'm fine. The instrument is fine. Uh, I don't want to I, return it. Could, I, Jamie, oh, Jamie, you haven't taken the trash out. Yes, dear. And you've left the toilet seat up. Yes, dear. Honestly, this lake is going to rack and ruin. <sighs> yes, dear. So, he says, I'm going to take you to Tilebo, the land where the sun rises, he says. We're, so we're going east. We're going to go back a little to Sundiata, the founder of the Mali Empire. Sundiata had a trusted general named Tiramakan Traore. In 1235, Traore led a group of 75,000 people, including 40,000 free men and women and 35,000 slaves and various artisans, and he led them west from the traditional Manding lands, and they headed west. They start in Mali, they head west. What's west of Mali? Senegambia. Sundiata also sent his son, a guy called Mansawali, with Traore to learn from him and as a sign of respect and trust. And this mass of people gradually wind their way westwards. Uh, it's slow, there's a lot of them, and it takes them a year to reach Wuli, which is on the eastern end of the Gambia. It's so long, they're actually growing and harvesting crops on the way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess there's no rush, right? Exactly. They, they're just, it's a stroll. Yeah. So is this a literal walk? I'm not sure. It's, is it a tale of the metaphor of the gradual migration of the Manding people from the more easterly locations to west? I'm not really clear. You could argue both ways. Now, at one point, this mass of people need to cross a river. Uh, and this is coming from a French source relying on both my French and Google Translate. So there may be okay. some details that are quite <laughs> awry. So they need to cross the river and Faro the god raises up the waters with a strong wind. He's upset. He doesn't want them to cross the river. Tiramakan pulls his knife out of his scabbard and severs his own little finger, letting the blood flow into the water. What? Why? Well, the blood sacrifice placates the gods and the water's oh. calm, allowing the canoes, they're called pirogues, of the people to cross the river safely. He cut his little finger. Sensible that though, isn't it? He picked the right finger. Well, like if you're going to cut anywhere, the little finger's the one to cut. If it were a Hollywood movie, he would have slit across oh, his they palm. they do that. That's, I, all, I, every time they do that, I think... And then why? Think? Why would you do that? Because <laughs> now you've That's just really take... limited your entire hand. Yeah, and you're usually in an, on an adventure of some kind. You're going to need that hand. Yeah, and yeah. then they and then they squeeze their, their hand, don't they, to squeeze the blood out. Absolutely, like, that's really necessary. Whereas I mean, he was sensible. He just went, well... I'll take this... Just a little off. bit of... But we're, first of all, we don't know how much blood it's going to take. So we'll just do a little bit first. Right, you can always move upwards. You can't go back. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. TLDR, too long, didn't read. Yeah. Uh, Tura Makang and his people ship out from Mali, head into the Gambia, yeah. have a fight and set up their own empire. Nice. But Tura Makang is not the only ancestor. The Jali is also going to tell us tales of Sora Musa. Uh, after Sundiata, we remember the original founder of Mali, defeated his rivals, he gives Sora Musa access to his magic and Musa sets off also with a force heading west. He travels widely until he comes to the Lower Gambia. And he marries a woman who's ruling the state of Badibu. And Sora Musa's people thrive and his descendants become ruler of, of the state of Niumi at the mouth of the Gambia. So why do we, the audience, though, care about the Jali's song? This is before our 1300-1400 time. It's in the mid-1200s. Well, as part of this tale, the Jali tells about long lineages. So to quote, Tiramakang was descended from Sisi. Sisi fathered Tamana. Tamana fathered Kembu. Kembu fathered Kembu and Teneng, and so on and so on and so on. Okay. And this is a, a rhythm you see quite often, isn't it? If you think about the Bible, so-and-so begat so-and-so. Yeah. And uh, these lineages to say, this is where you come from it's an unbroken chain of people back to these heroes so this is your classic origin story but it's much more than that as well though because the jolly goes on he says the tarawa's surname is tiramakang the surname dembele is tiramakang the surname jabate is tiramakang the surname job is tiramakang the surname juf is tiramakang the surname sane is tiramakang the surname mane is tiramakang and these are all people in the audience. This is the surnames. These are your people. Your surname comes from this guy who set out from Mali and achieved great things and established your people, which is how we came to be sitting here in front of you. You're descended from heroes. This is where you come from. This is your story. And so as our village gathers in the 1300s in Gambia, they look to the Jali to remind us of where we came from hmm. and how we made the breakthrough from the lands in the east <laughs> yeah. into the riverside village in which we live, laugh and love today. That's great. And also, this is, of course, the story of how I made a breakthrough in researching <laughs> this rather challenging podcast and introduced you, Ryan, to a little bit of the Gambia from 1300 
1400. So there you have it. You Everything made, I have to offer you. You made a breakthrough. <laughs> I made a breakthrough of sorts. Are you happy? I forced a breakthrough in some might say. <laughs> <laughs> and you did a fab job. Well done. That is, it's never easy to get these old time periods where there's very little written down and to find such detail about a time period um, in, in West Africa like that, I think you deserve all the applause. So well done. I have a medal. Oh, thank you very much. It says H-H-E on it. I love it. I should wear it forever. Well, I need it back. <laughs> it's a loner. It's yeah, yeah, like yeah. the FA Cup, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you get it for a couple of days. Okay, I'll take that. All right. So there we go. That is making a breakthrough in the Gambia during 1300 to 1400 CE. Pete, congratulations and well done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the Gambia. But the eyes of the world turn their beady stare <laughs> from you to me with expectation. Entertain us, they say. Yes, <laughs> Educate because us. you know what happens now, don't you? Absolutely. It's time to desolate. It's time to do the randomization. Yes. And I'm going to switch it on. And we're good to go. So, Peter, with no further ado, please tell me what is my place for next episode. And your country is... Not a country. In fact, it's the Northern Hemisphere. The Northern Hemisphere. The Northern Hemisphere. That's half the world to choose yeah. from, my friend. That's good. That's a lot of stuff. I think, and I want to hear about all of it, right? <laughs> yeah. I want to know how many Frances it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. And your time period is... Ooh, also relatively unorthodox. Okay. It's 24 hours. Yeah. Okay, 24 we'll hours. One, Fine. All right, and the topic then. And your topic is... <laughs> work your magic okay. with abracadabra. Abracadabra? Abracadabra. Oh, this is great. That's a funny old combination, isn't it? That's quite unusual for us. Do you reckon I'll be able to pull this one out of the hat? Oh, I don't <laughs> doubt it. <laughs> I'm not picking a card. If you've arrived with a deck of cards and a big top hat, I'll be delighted. I'll scratch that off my mental list of things that I'm going to do. <laughs> okay, so it's abracadabra in the Northern Hemisphere <laughs> over 24 hours. Let's see what you come up with. That's a really interesting one. Okay, well, look, that is our show for this week. Thank you, everyone, for listening. If you'd like to get in touch about any of the things that Pete has talked about on this show, or you just want to say hello to us both, uh, you can reach out to us through our website at hhepodcast.com or by email at Pete and Ryan at hhepodcast.com. We'd be delighted to hear from you. We love it when people talk to us, and you never know, you might end up featured on a future show. Yeah, and one way to definitely feature on a future episode is to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. Your recommendation recommendation really goes a long way to bringing the show to new listeners and just to letting us know how great we are uh, yeah we love to hear that and if you are a social media person tiktok instagram facebook or twitter you can find us at hhe podcast and subscribe to them you'll get an alert when we do a little one minute animated hhe bite that's right we are going to be back again soon with the verdict and i can't wait to hear what <laughs> what grade you get for this one <laughs> I, I can't even imagine and that's it i guess all that's left to say is you've been listening to History happened everywhere. episode of the Gambia you were talking about crops yeah yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah well how do Gambians get their flour so fine um I don't know how do the Gambians get their flour so fine they mill it da 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 da
15, you're fired.